Hello and welcome all to the third episode of our De Greuter Corona Talks, today with the wonderful Ida Milne, who will talk about long-term impacts of the 1918-1919 influenza. Hi Ida, so nice to have you. Thank you very much for having me on. Thanks. Um, Ida is a historian of disease uh, and European history lecturer at Carlo College and visiting research fellow at Trinity College Dublin at the School of Histories and Humanities. She's the author of um, the book Stacking the Coffins, Influenza, War and Revolution in Ireland, 1918 to 1919, published by Manchester University Press in 2018. And so we are going to start this with uh, Ida's talk, followed by a quick discussion between the two of us and then opening up to questions from the audience. And I think I speak for everyone watching now when I say we can't wait to hear about the one past pandemic that is compared with our current one the most. Ida, please take it from here. Okay, I'll just, I'll just share my screen and start my presentation now. Oh, sorry. Have you, can you see the screen now? Just checking. Yes. Um, so on the 18th of May 2020, members of the Irish COVID Influencers Group uh, discussed the impact having medical workers as parents during the coronavirus pandemic was having on their children. The group was set up by respiratory consultant, Professor Oshin O'Connell, as a rapid response network of medical professionals, key politicians, civil servants, business people, journalists, and one historian, uh, to share research and convey time sensitive information to the public during the crisis. It's been enormously successful. It communicated mostly um, through the social media platform, WhatsApp. And on this day, on the 18th of May, 2020, an intensive care specialist and mother said, my toddler is afraid to come near me until I've showered and doesn't want to leave our house at all now. It's awful. Another mother and a pediatrician responded, it really is. My daughter rushes in for the hugs when I get home, then checks herself, jumps back and tells me she has the immersion on to heat the water for my shower. Children are sticklers for rules. As the historian to the group and as an oral historian of the 1918-19 influenza pandemic, really keenly interested in disease memory, I was fascinated. The responses from these 21st century children really echoed material I had collected from child witnesses to the 20th century pandemic at the end of their lives, over 90 years after it had happened. They too absorbed the changes in parental behavior and the extreme tension emanating from parents about the disease threat, even though their parents also tried to shield the children from their worry. One interviewee in 1918, a five-year-old girl living in Sandymount, an affluent suburb of Dublin, told of her interest being piqued when her parents gathered in huddles with their friends at parties, discussing the disease in hushed tones and clamming up when the children came close. She was an early reader and combed newspapers to inform herself, learning of this frightening disease which was sweeping across the world. In neighboring Donnybrook, another interviewee told me her mother and aunts spoke in a kind of code about a neighbor dying from influenza, leaving her children orphaned. The code was to keep it hidden from, the ch from their children. The, 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 this lady's father had already, uh, the, the father of, of this, uh, the husband of this lady had already died in the Great War. So again, this talk, talking in code told the child witnesses that uh, the parents were full of fear about the disease and they too became curious listeners trying to overhear more snippets about the disease and pooling their information with each other. Perhaps in 90 years time, some historian like me will interview today's children to see what they recorded. But unlike the 1918-1919 period, historians of the future will have a real wealth of oral history interviews to draw on, as so many are being collected at present around the world. And some projects are already using my and other 1918 interviews to inform this collecting. The broader lesson from these interviews with child survivors or the bereaved of the 1918-19 pandemic for the current crisis is that this is not just about the now. This experience will remain with all of us, but particularly with the bereaved and COVID-19 survivors for the rest of their lives. It will impact on mental health as well as physical in the long term as well as the short term and may well affect family economics, just like happened with my interviewees. <laughs> 
Irish historical research on the 1918-19 pandemic was slow to take off compared to other places. The work of the US environmental historian Alfred Crosby had something of a snowball effect on research from the 1970s on, with studies swiftly following from researchers like Howard Phillips in South Africa, Geoffrey Rice in New Zealand, and so on. Here, the research began in Ireland in the 21st century, an extraordinary delay, given that the pandemic was closely integrated into Irish current affairs, including its engagement with both the World War and the Irish Revolutionary Period. Historians working on Irish affairs focused instead on political and military history, on separation from Britain and nation building, rather than on social history, including health. That lacuna has had a peculiar effect on influenza memory. I found that my interviewees often knew of their own family experience of the pandemic, or maybe had an idea that they had a disease that was in some way related at that time, but had no national narrative in which to situate that experience. Work from emerging influenza historians, uh, Katrina Foley, Patricia Marsh and myself, uh, constructed a national influenza narrative this century, which was widely shared during the centenary years. And so people began to research their own family connections to the disease with the assistance also of new online death certification, which confirmed what, they, what disease they died from. And I've been collecting influenza memories since 2006. When I began my doctoral research on the history of the 1918-1919 flu pandemic in Ireland, and was initially, um, my gaze perhaps entranced uh, by those massive death statistics, the 50 million dead that the WHO estimates. I was focusing initially on the statistics and my supervisor in Trinity College Dublin, Professor David Dixon, quickly convinced me that there was still a narrowing window to collect living memory. He even uh, provided the first interviewee. Um, renowned cultural historian and equally renowned TCD um, eccentric Professor R.B. McDowell, who even in high summer could be seen walking around campus wrapped up in an overcoat and woolen scarf. The picture uh, uh, on the slide there was taken in a very hot August. R.B. had caught it as a five-year-old boy in Belfast. His upper middle-class parents were told by the family physician that he wouldn't live through the night. At our initial interview, as he was quite deaf, I handed him a list of 12 typed questions. He answered each one in turn through his perspective, speaking about the effects of the fever, medical treatments, and then putting the list away, went away from the structured interview questions and told how it had killed their family nanny and given him the lifelong feeling that he was an invalid, that scarf was a real giveaway, which affected his choice of career. Indeed, the first time I met him, as soon as I said, how do you do, he proceeded to tell me his blood pressure data. He said that in re relation to his career, um, the family thought that the army was definitely out. And should I go to the bar, could I put up with the strain of that? He decided against becoming a barrister as academia was considered more suitable for someone with his delicate health, perhaps not an option we would consider today. Suddenly, I was looking at my big data through a whole new lens. This wasn't about statistics. It was about real people and their fight to live, to beat off a disease which we now know was killing those 50 million people and more, to handle the chronic illness and the loss of confidence in health, which survivors, including RB, sometimes endured. At least 23,000 Irish people died from it, and perhaps 800,000 caught it and survived it, of which this old man in front of me was one. From RB's reflections, I began to get a sense that this was something not long ago, but something that was still in the memories of people around me, whether as survivors or family of the dead. His interviews showed that for some survivors, survivors, it was not an event which had a finite end, but continued its memory impacting on future life decisions. And that sense of the presence of memory of that century old health catastrophe in the community is actually growing 14 years later as I collect more and more pandemic uh, stories. And even as the chance of uh, collecting li living memory closes. In all, I've collected over 50 interviews, some quite short, others which were repeated over several months as we probed and shaped stories. <clears throat> 
Uh, the survivor interviewees ranged in age from 93 to 106 years when I interviewed them and had experienced it between the ages of three and 15. My oldest interviewee, Kathleen McMenamin, from Rathmullen in the north um, west of Ireland in County Donegal, lived to 107 and had a very clear memory of her nurse, mother nursing ill neighbours and thought that the British Navy stationed in Loch Swilly was the main reason that uh, County Donegal suffered the worst in the flu, uh, far worse than other parts of the country. The impact of the 1918-19 flu in Irish society was broadly similar to elsewhere in the world. It spread around the country in three waves, in May and June and the autumn of 1918, and in the spring of 1919. As it passed through communities, entire towns and suburbs would be stilled, businesses curtailed, public buildings and schools closed, courts postponed. People stayed at home either because they were ill, entire families would be down at the same time and sometimes died together as well, or because they were fearful of catching it. So while there was no formal restriction on people's movement, the disease stilled society naturally. People mentioned the quiet in towns and along the canals. Hospitals and the poor law medical dispensary service already suffering staff shortages as so many were away at the war were overwhelmed and turned over most wards to the flu. Poor law doctors, nurses and pharmacists worked long hours almost around the clock trying desperately to save people. Neighbours rode in to nurse and feed neighbours and again this is something that came from the oral history interviews and it, it wasn't really at all unusual for families to have multiple deaths. Young adults aged 25 to 35 were the unusual age cohort, which from the official death statistics had the highest rate of death. Uh, this cohort wouldn't normally be affected by seasonal influences. And of course, this had a, uh, a severe impact on families as the group also tended to be the parents of young children. Losing one or both parents could have serious economic as well as emotional repercussions. Children under five too died in higher proportions than any other age groups, causing another tragic impact on families. And while the age profile dying from COVID-19 is, is different, more usually over 70s, we do hear of parents of young families dying now too, tragically. When I started interviewing, I expected to find detail about the immediate crisis, what it was like to suffer the disease, the engagement with the health services, treatments. My witnesses did tell me that, and sometimes in great detail. One I interviewed, this gentleman, Tommy Christian, who was six at the time, recalled waking with a pain in his throat so severe he said you'd never forget it, and told me the family, the doctor visited his family at three o'clock in the morning, as he said, coming in an old jalopy, to administer linseed poultices and hot whiskey punch to alleviate the symptoms, even for a six-year-old. The surprising find was not about the immediate crisis, but rather the long-term fallout for families from the disease, and I suppose in a way this finding may be also very useful to inform our contemporary crisis. Some told of parents who died and of families having to cope not only with the trauma of grief, but have changed economic circumstances. The loss of the family home and the separation of children were common findings. And indeed that was also part of Tommy Christian's story. On our third interview, Tommy revealed he thought that his mother's death had been hastened by the flu. She had tuberculosis, but he said she was never the same after having the flu. His father remarried and he and his sister were raised by a aunt. They weren't part of the new family. Minnie Crothers, this beautiful lady on the right hand side of your screen there, was a mother of four young children. She died from influenza in Belfast in December 1918. Her grief stricken, sorry, November 1918, her grief stricken husband decided the family needed a new start and moved them all to Canada. He couldn't get work at first and the family were taken into care, compounding the trauma of, of loss of mother, home and family networks. James Delaney, a Dublin Metropolitan Police Constable, suffered flu in December 1918 but returned to work quickly. As so many of his colleagues were down ill, he felt pressure to go back in. He died on the job in January from pneumonia, aged only 29. His death and the loss of his salary forced his wife Margaret to work. And while she was setting up her cake making business, she sent their two small children, Dennis and Beck, to the family in the Midlands to be minded. De Beck, the little beautiful little girl standing on the chair on the screen, died from scarlet fever a year later. Dennis was effectively wrapped in cotton wool by his family, not allowed to play any games other than cricket as they were afraid they would lose him also. 
These losses and instabilities had a lifelong damaging effect on Dennis, his only daughter, Anne, told me. These oral histories add the human voice to impersonal records like death statistics and news reports. They tell the little picture of the individual human or family experience, the damage to families and to individual health, the trauma of loss. They point very strongly to the long-term emotional family done to children as their families were altered, separated or destroyed by the flu. They do inform other data on the impact on the poor, for example. Uh, Stella Larkin told me of her grandmother's struggle to nurse sick children in the 1910s um, in a one-room tenement with no running water, just like the one in the picture here. And how her children, uh, her grandmother's children died not only from flu, but also from diarrhea and measles. So a broader societal problem uh, for the poor in particular. Um, essentially because of bad living con conditions. And Sven Erik Mauland uh, from Oslo, Oslo has done really important work emphasizing the importance of socioeconomic uh, conditions uh, to your chances of surviving or dying in a pandemic. So these details enhance our understanding of the big picture of 1918 and 1919. Behind each of those 50 million dead, the WHO lists for the pandemic. There's a grieving family whose lives are changed. The memory of those individuals offer building blocks for broader analysis through many different prisms for that pandemic. And they and new interviews will for the current pandemic also. Thank you. Thank so, you so much, Ida. Stop sharing my screen. Yes, thank you. That was a, a fascinating talk, thank you. Um, framing um, a past pandemic as a great teacher, as you did in your fantastic essay in our um, pamphlet, Perspectives on the Pandemic, um, which was published in May, is quite a unique way of looking at a global health crisis, I would say. But I completely agree with the notion to look at things we can learn from how people previously dealt with crises like that. So if you don't mind, um, I'd like to, to ask you a couple of questions now. Sure. Um, so since you, you mentioned interviews a lot, interviews with uh, survivors, um, and you are one of the renowned oral historians, I mean, the vice chair of the Oral History Network of Ireland, um, would you mind telling the, the, the audience a little bit about um, the benefits of using oral history as a method? Well, I suppose particularly uh, in relation to disease, um, it gives the individual patient experience and a voice that you can't get from the written record generally. And even the idea, I think, of, of looking at the patient perspective is, is relatively new. People tended in the past to look at um, uh, the history of medicine through the history of the professional classes, rather than looking at it through the, the prism of the, of the patient experience. Um, and it's something that actually medicine itself at the Oral History Association at meeting in Utah last September, uh, there were a lot of medical students there who wanted to get into this idea of seeing about the long interview and how, what that, how that could help them actually as, um, as a medical tool. Uh, you know, for, particularly for disease puzzles, uh, where, where you could just take a long life story to try and figure something out rather than a very short focused uh, diagnostic interview. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's, it's useful in lots of different ways. Thanks. So why, why was this disease not more part of um, our all common memory? Why was it mostly neglected until, well, basically until COVID-19 hit, hit us this year? It's a fascinating question, Rebea, and I, I think there are multiple answers for it. Um, one is that our focus, um, the focus of historians was chiefly because the, that was in such an important period uh, with the war and in Ireland, the revolutionary period, um, that they tended to focus on uh, what I call boy history, on um, military and political history rather than, and even economic history, rather than on um, social history. And social history indeed didn't, didn't become as popular as it is today on, until really after the Second World War. And I suppose it became a different lens and way of seeing at, at that stage. But I think there's another reason, and um, it's partly um, 
the story that Stella McConnell Larkin told me about all, you know, her, her aunt, her little aunt dying from the flu, little Mary Moore died from the flu um, at almost five years of age. And at that time in Irish society, um, one fifth of all the deaths of the 70,000 or so on the island each year were of children under the age of five. And that's almost unimaginable to our contemporary lens. So disease, death from disease was very normal and particularly for death of children from disease was really normal. So in a way, I think the flu didn't stick out. It was just one more um, tragedy in, in, in many tragedies. Uh, Stella McConnell and Larkin, um, her mother was the only one who survived of 10 children over the age of five. And the other children died from things like di diarrhea uh, measles, um, pneumonia, um, diseases that we wouldn't expect children to die from today. So I think that's one of the reasons, you know, the, the death from disease was was quite common mm. uh, compared to today. And we, we tend to forget that because we have a different perspective now. Yeah, sure. So you, do you have any idea why no other flu pandemic of that scale or with that death toll um, did um, occur again until now? I mean, is there a kind of an historical explanation to this? Um, maybe, well, obviously the war, the uh, 1916 revolution, etc. cetera. Well, the war caused an extraordinary um, movement of people, uh, particularly because America was entering the war and ferrying people really rapidly across the Atlantic over into the, into the arena of war. Um, and then, of course, right across Europe, you had so many soldiers kept in really bad conditions um, where disease could spread really, really quickly. Um, that's one reason. But I think the other one is just we haven't had a novel virus of the kind of capability of causing it. And um, curiously, only uh, May last year, the Irish president, Michael D.B. Higgins, held a commemoration um, for uh, the pandemic at which I and Guy Viner and Patricia Marsh uh, spoke alongside the president. And one of the things we made sure to do was to pay tribute to people, workers in future pandemics because we said it will happen. We just didn't expect it to happen so quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned in your book, um, changes in global healthcare resulting from the, uh, from the flu pandemic uh, in 1918, 1919. So could you elaborate what those changes were? And do you see similar things happening today? In an Irish context, the, the, the Irish Public Health Council uh, did a report uh, in the immediate aftermath of the flu. And even though um, they didn't mention the flu at all, it wasn't mentioned, uh, it, they began meeting in October um, 1919, reported in 1920. Uh, it was quite clear that the flu had informed just about every decision they made because of the way um, it, it highlighted problems within the health system. And they talked a lot about setting up medical laboratories to investigate and to explore and things like that that were clearly very much informed by the new bacteriology as well, uh, which was the kind of wonder kind of medicine at the time. Um, Isil Jones, the tremendous Canadian historian, has written, and even quite recently, about how um, this pandemic and what happened uh, informed and uh, spurred on the development of socialized medicine, the idea of universal healthcare. And she can see that in Canada and it's happened in other parts of the world as well. And probably influenced things like the NHS in Britain as well. You know, it was one part of um, the way people could see the need for something like that. It also influenced um, the setting up of the Sentinel, Sentinel influenza monitoring that we have today through the OIHP, mm -hmm. uh, and which was later uh, submerged into the WHO. Okay. Um, yes, I think it is going to influence, certainly in Ireland, there's a lot of talk about uh, changing our health system and making it better and moving maybe towards a single care, uh, single um, tier health system. Mm. Okay. So we are talking a lot about possible long-term effects of COVID-19 these days. Were there long-term effects um, after, this, the, after, after having the Spanish flu? Um, and maybe in addition, um, one of the biggest concerns of our current situation 
seems to be the uncertainty around this new virus and possible mutations and things like that. Was that something people back then were also concerned with? Oh, very much concerned with the, with the idea of mutations and, and, and changes. And of course, um, statistically, um, we would be, if we were in 1918 now, we would be just in the first of three waves and the mildest wave, you know, that the first few months in the summer, mm. spring and summer of 1918, were the, the smallest and, and mildest of three or even four waves somewhere some, in some places in the world. Um, so they were they were very aware. Tommy Christian, my interviewee, I said, why didn't they talk about it? And he said, we stopped talking about it because it kept coming back and back again. We thought if we stopped talking about it, it wouldn't come back again. First part of your question, remind me. Um, first part, um, the uh, long term effects. Long term effects. Um, there were um, quite a lot. Again, Tommy Christian said quite a lot of bad chess came out of it. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it was was it Smith Eli Jellif had a look, look at um, what happened. A very early pu publication in uh, Cruikshank's book looked at an essay there. Looked at a lot of the long term uh, things like ocular effects, uh, heart, heart uh, issues, heart. Uh, issues with the nervous system, and of course the the the, the, the famous um, encephalitis lethargica, uh, which was portrayed in the film Awakenings, where people were um, in in a sort of semi coma, a, 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 almost a trance-like state for often years afterwards, and often institutionalized or else kept you know at home and not able to function as normal human beings. So that that was one of the really more dramatic effects. Mm. Okay. And children being impacted by the pandemic, although we, we just learned that it was way worse uh, in 1918, 1919 than it is now. Um, but that's something parents are struggling with today as well. Is there anything in the interviews um, with the su survivors that we can use um, to help parents struggling today to in, in order to, to help them um, interact with their children, talk about it, or don't? You heard the most amazing things. One of my friends shared uh, an image that her little daughter had drawn on the, on the path outside their home in chalk, a picture of the coronavirus bug as a, as a, as a personality, mm -hmm. and um, with saying, stay away from our family, a little speak <laughs> bubble from it. And so many people are telling stories like this. And I think one of the things the 1918 interviews show, and again, like, you know, what the, the two medical doctors I quoted at the beginning were, is you're not going to keep this away from children. So you have to find a way uh, to explain it to them. You can't deny it to them because they will perhaps worry more if you, if you deny mm -hmm. it to them. And children, as I think my interviewees showed, they coped really admirably with it you know they were so resourceful trying to find out more and also not wa wanting to worry their parents by letting on to the parents that they they knew about it you know they mm -hmm. were quite crafty about that yeah. but I think that's the main thing is to realize children can be an, an awful lot more um understanding uh, of these circumstances than, than we tend to think them of, uh, as being mm -hmm. yeah so never underestimate children yeah and um, so maybe well, for me, um, the most interesting thing to know about is uh, how did the Spanish flu end? I mean, you said there were three waves, sometimes four, mm -hmm. and then it was just over, just like that? Yes, well, I've spoken to my virologist uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Kim Roberts in Trinity College Dublin to, to answer that question. If I may adapt her words, I probably won't do it the uh, science as much justice as she would. But she said that basically by, by you know, 1920, it had infected, I think, South America, and northern, northern Scandinavia in, in, in the fourth waves. And she said that basically everybody who was likely to catch it, um, what had caught it by then, but it, that it stayed circulating. So it didn't have pandemic uh, capabilities. It wasn't a new virus until um, the pandemic in, in uh, 1958. And then it was replaced by the strain that came along then. And that it um, appeared again, I think in the 1970s. And uh, it's still, I think, was cir circulating again until 2009. And indeed, I think I read the other day that there's a new, uh, 2009 was a H1N1 as well, but there's a new uh, H1N1 uh, circulating, I think, again now in, in Asia. 
uh, that's causing some concern at the moment. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, okay, so we we'll jump uh, to questions from the audience now. Um, and I just read them out to you. Sure. So the, the first one is, when we talk publicly about the history of World War I in Europe, the Spanish flu seems to be treated as more of a footnote. Has its significance been underestimated thus far or are we overstating its significance now because we're living through something similar? Um, I'm part of a, an international network of um, researchers from different disciplines who look at the flu. And one of the people who's been uh, looking particularly at uh, the impact of the flu on the war is Howard Phillips from South Africa. And um, he talks particularly about how its impact in, the, in that, you know, really important last year of the war and how it affects the, um, if I'm getting him correctly, uh, the American, the French and the British first, and then moves onwards, uh, then, then it impacts on all, much more severely on the German army towards the end of the war. And that quite a few of the German army are down sick. I think he had something like 400,000 by October uh, 1918. So um, I think his take is that it doesn't end the war, but that it influences or has to have some kind of impact that we perhaps haven't taken into account enough uh, beforehand. In fact, in, in a lot of the histories of the war, you'll see it not mentioned at all. It has to have some sort of impact. Mm -hmm. And of course, so how, the, the reason sorry. why it gets the name Spanish is because the censorship of the uh, armies of the war prevented being mentioned in those newspapers at the time, you know, that in case of weakened position to the enemy, so the enemy would know where they were weak. Which just answered the second question. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how important was it for contemporaries, um, the, the, the Spanish flu, as opposed to the experience of the war itself? Um, to me, it's a little bit like a home and away experience of the war. They might have family away at the war, and that's the, the away issue. And um, the, the, the home thing is that the, the flu is part of the war and brings it home to people. Um, it's difficult to weed out the overall impact of the war from the influenza and you know you have issues like wartime inflation also which which um cause difficulties with treating the flu because things like the price of coal go up the price of bread goes up the price of sugar goes up uh, that means the price of medicines also goes up um so all those things impact on uh, both flu and on war um i suppose war is the longer term impact um, and flu, it's just, uh, as RB said, it seemed like it wasn't fair that we were hit with this thing when we'd survived all those years of war and now we've been hit with one more thing. Yeah, doesn't sound fair. It's mm. true. <laughs> um, were any mistakes made during the Spanish flu that we can learn from now? From mistakes? I suppose the big one was that um, they were vaccinating people uh, like in Dublin, Dr. Kathleen Lynn was, it was uh, she had got uh, vaccinations made up in um, uh, the university hospital and several other people had different vaccinations made up and they understood um, the flu to be caused by a bacteria. So the vaccinations were made from bacteria. And I thought these would have a universally bad effect, but actually some scientists have said to me that actually, no, they might have done things like one of the um, um, strains in it was um, Pfeiffer's bacillus, which is actually Haemophilus influenza bacillus, mm -hmm. and that they might prevent against a HIV infection. Um, so I suppose the thing is, uh, I think that it really has taught us and that we've had to learn now too, is that um, science, uh, we talk a lot about evidence-based medicine or evidence-based science. And when you get something like a new uh, disease like this, you have to go against your training to realize that uh, you have to, the studies are going to take a little time and then mm -hmm. you have to treat it a little bit instinctively as well as, as relying on evidence-based medicine. Um, I probably have scientists up in arms <laughs> having said that, but some of them have also said this, you know, that... Mm -hmm. um, when you have something new and you haven't got the studies to show what's the case, um, you have to have, leave your mind open to that. Yep, agree. 
Um, next question. Uh, you mentioned childhood in your paper. So do you think, I mean, a little bit of that uh, you already answered, but do you think the pandemic will change the concept of childhood significantly, such as uh, eroding the division between protected childhood and the adult world? That's a really interesting question. And, you know, um, sometimes I wonder, um, do we need to let children be a little bit more grown up and take responsibility? And they've had to do it. When you see those stories that my two colleagues told about how their uh, children had to learn not to hug and uh, that the one child learned to switch on the shower for mother so she could have her shower quicker when she came in. So, you know, that the, 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 they... Um, uh, you know, maybe we need to learn to let our children grow up a little bit and, and take more responsibility. Mm. I mean, probably after the war and the revolution as well, mm. um, that happened anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. But for, for us today, it's, it's a little bit more difficult, I think, because we tend to mm. uh, let children be children for as long as possible. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm. Um, next question. In what ways can policymakers benefit from the experiences of historical facts relating to the pandemic? Well, I suppose um, what I found fascinating, I was writing pieces for newspapers from the 6th of February onwards. And I could look at my research and almost predict what was going to happen the following week and the week after that. And like one of the things that I was promoting early on uh, was the introduction of confidence measures so that governments would look and control because fear, of course, an unmanageable fear um, is not a good thing. And so they had to, you know, like, for example, in Ireland, we've had daily uh, press conferences with the uh, chief medical officer and what we call NEFET, our, our national public, public health emergency team, tell us, telling us exactly what they're doing. And even if they probably didn't feel very much in control at all in the early stages, it gave a sense of structure and that we knew what was going on and that there, that there was something, um, um, you know, that the government was in some way doing their best to be in charge and to manage this crisis. And the same thing happened, uh, you know, that the idea of the, the, the um, uh, Wuhan authorities building those, saying they were going to build those hospitals in five, six, seven days. You know, again, that was a way of showing people that they were uh, controlling the situation or that they had plans to control the situation. So I think um, they need to look probably more carefully at uh, confidence measures. And of course, I think one thing we'd all love them to see is to have a stockpile of masks and, and protective equipment. Uh, that they shouldn't let, ever let that run down in the, in the way that they did before, because they didn't really believe that something like that could happen again. Mm -hmm. did the, know, that, that should be part of policy, I think, internationally, mm -hmm. and more international cooperation. I think, although the international cooperation has been really good, that group that I spoke about, uh, the COVID influences group, we had a, a contact in China who actually got us uh, that the, the, the doctors on a group a face to face meeting. Uh, with doctors in a Wuhan hospital so that when it came to the Irish man management of the crisis, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. And in many ways, I think that that, that group that Professor O'Connell set up uh, was really influential in, um, in helping out the situation here. And we've done quite well as a country. You know, we've lost, is it 1,700, I think, which is awfully sad. Uh, but it isn't anything like, you know, given the scale of... Um, we had one of the lowest amounts of intensive care beds in Europe, um, if not the lowest, when this crisis started. So we couldn't really let, it was really imperative that we didn't let a widespread scale outbreak happen. Um, mm. So um, I think we learned lots of things, that, that that group learned a lot of things from talking to doctors in uh, Wuhan and also in, in Northern Italy. Mm. So those kind of measures, international cooperation are really good at, at a very practical level. What would you say the the, uh, the impact of um, media coverage plays, especially in comparison uh, with the Spanish film and today? It was remarkably similar. Uh, you could almost predict the headlines that were coming. Um, things like the you know a doctor says the fear is more dangerous than the disease. Well, no, it's not. Uh, but but those uh, headlines happened in 1918, and they also happened. Uh, now as well. Uh, generally speaking, I think the media have been really responsible. Um, 
and have played very active roles. And of course, um, in that particular, again, in the COVID influences group, uh, Professor O'Connell included members of the leading newspapers and RTE, um, our national broadcaster and other broadcasters, uh, so that um, they would have really well-informed information. And I think that's probably is a good thing uh, for the media is, is, is to have some kind of a feed where you can, be, can, can uh, know that the information you're getting is really reliable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one question uh, is, um, what history books about this pandemic should a public health doctor read? Well, of course, I'll say mine. Yours, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, because I, I suppose I have a background in journalism, so I tended to, to look at it through a very um, news angle, if you like. I, I do one chapter on news, but another one on, on um, others on medicine and different aspects of it. Um, The uh, Laura Spinney's book is a fantastic oversight mm -hmm. of 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 um, it's a pen writer. Um, I'm trying to think of who of my friends I would leave out of this. Uh, Mark Honig's poems work is work is brilliant. Uh, Nancy Bristow's in in North America. Uh, Howard Phillips' uh, wonderful work um, on South mm -hmm. Africa. Uh, Jeff Rice in 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 um, New Zealand. And I'm probably leaving out somebody. Oh, um, um, there are two really seminal books on it. And uh, one was by Niall Johnson on the case in Britain. Jürgen Muller's done work, I think, in Germany and, and on Africa as well. Um, mm -hmm. But the other, the big book, I suppose, on it is a um, big academic book on it, uh, was the book emerging from a, a Cape Town co conference hosted by Howard Phillips at the end of the Uh, last century and which was published I think in 2003 uh, he and David Killingray uh, edited it and it really had studies from around the world and, and certainly as a postgraduate student I couldn't wait to get my hands on it and it remained on my bedside table for many many years um, <laughs> it's a fantastic uh, um, work we flu historians tend to get a little bit obsessive <laughs> um. Hey, next question. Um, was the Spanish flu a global pandemic in a similar way um, that COVID is now? But I think you answered that uh, with a yes. Previously. Yes, it absolutely was. I think the only place that got it were some islands in uh, was it the Pacific um, that have since disappeared, uh, sunk back into the sea. Um, but um, it really infected more or less every country in the world, not equally. Um, mm -hmm. Some places like um, amongst um, uh, the Inuit, um, it could affect them much worse, as, as does all new diseases, because they're less likely to have endemic um, disease there. So, um, you know, so, some villages in, in Alaska, I think there might be um, they might have had 50% dead, whereas more typically it would be about 2.5% of those who caught it mm. uh, would die. Mm. Okay. So you'd say that globalization um, didn't play a role at all if you compare today with uh, 1918? It spread extraordinarily fast in 1918. Mm. But then railways were at the peak of their... Um, their growth in 1918, 1919, uh, shipping had improved enormously. And of course you had the, 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 all the war traffic uh, right around the world. I mean, okay. when you think about it, Australia managed to delay much in the same way that they did today. They handled it in a very similar way in 1918. They kept the, the ships offshore until, and wouldn't let people uh, come up, you know, kind of quarantine them offshore until, until mm. they were sent them free. And um, Australia did quarantine um, its returning um, immigrants now as well um, but there wasn't that kind of activity didn't happen in many parts of the world quite surprising mm. it wasn't considered in Ireland and I think that's probably because um, we had become so much an important role in the war at that stage because America had just entered the war and they were based on the island in several different locations um, offering support for the convoys coming to and from the arena of war so I think um, I looked and looked uh, through the War Office files to try and find some mention of that, but I think that that's probably uh, the reason I can't find confirmation. If anybody does find it, I'd love to know. Mm -hmm. right. Do you think um, this generation's personal concept of history will change due to living through uh, such turbulent times? <laughs> 
Oh, what a fascinating question. Yes, I think we all have, if they don't know it already, the, the, the children are feeling that they are part of history. Uh, and I know a lot of um, schools uh, around the world um, are, and particularly uh, groups like uh, Defining Moments Canada, Neil Orford's group, mm -hmm. are uh, focusing very much on um, children and collecting and archiving and noting what's going on at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a wonderful way to enable children to understand how important it is. One thing that struck me, um, I was looking at a school here in North Kildare, a Jesuit school called Clongas Wood College. And they had really good records of the outbreak there in the college, which is why I was, I I was using them. Uh, but I noticed on the list of students was a guy called James Deeney. He was 11 years of age at the time. Uh, when it hit the school. And James Dealey in the 1950s became the principal uh, engineer of reform in the Irish health system. And he was always mm. interested, always doing studies on infectious disease. So how is this going to inspire um, young doctors, scientists of the future? Um, you know, their personal experience of it, what they see up close and how they then incorporate that into their work or their passion later on. And the same thing mm -hmm. with the historians, of course, too. Yeah. So it, it, it will probably strengthen and not weaken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, so. yeah, yeah. Because then we have a better chance that people will learn from it. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I mean, there's a lot of um, archiving going on. Uh, I think it started in March, um, all over Europe, um, I don't know as much about the US, but where, where different um, Corona archives were built up with, yes. um, I don't know, images from, from children, what they draw, what they drew and uh, things like that. So I think that's, that's uh, really something for future historians to look into. Um, next question. It was really um, pleasing actually to see how quickly archivists got on board with this. Like I had yeah. calls from early February from people saying, look, we're starting to archive this. Do you want to be in on it? In on it? You know, places like the British Library, yeah. the National Archives in Dublin, the National Library in Dublin in particular was very, very quick to start off. And my own college, uh, the archivist there, Bernie DC, started collecting um, in early March uh, oral histories, which I was, mm -hmm. you know, was really good to see. Yep. Because everything changes so fast. How we felt in February, March, isn't how we feel now. We, we've mm -hmm. reached a level of acceptance about it. It's very different. Yeah, different, yeah, mm. that's true. Um, and we were also seeing a, a wave of um, conspiracy theories and anti-Semitic and racist responses to COVID-19. Uh, was there anything um, similar happening during the Spanish flu? I haven't seen um, anti-Semitic responses, although I, I have heard um, certainly um, conspiracies because, of course, the war was on. And one of the things, uh, conspiracies that flew around in America was that Bayer was infecting aspirin with the flu. And it was actually coming in through the boxes of aspirin, oh. uh, the very thing that was being used to treat the flu. And the other thing you, you find easily on the Internet is that the um, anti-vaccination people were around then as they are now, and they were saying um, that it was um, actually not caused by a new disease at all, but was a reaction to vaccination for the army heading off to Europe. Oh, okay. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Cool. And what about face masks? Um, were they mandatory during the Spanish flu? And were people playing along, were they, or were they resisting wearing them? It's really hard to find evidence for them in Ireland. Um, the, 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 they seem to be worn in hospitals, but I, I have actually no picture of a mask mm. in an Irish context. Of course, we see them in San Francisco and lots of places in, in America. There's terrific images of them. Um, but we do hear accounts of people having scarves wrapped around their faces and dousing them in eucalyptus oil and things like that in, in, in the Irish newspapers. Um, there is a terrific uh, series of cartoons um, in the British Cartoon Archive by W.K. Hazelden, whose uh, interest in flu was really piqued when his father caught it in the 1800s. And when the flu came along, he, 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 he um, was very, acute at um, 
capturing the fear. And he always had masks or, you know, that if somebody sneezed on the tube and perfectly ordinary carriage would suddenly everybody would have veils, masks and all sorts of things like, like that on after it. So um, in Ireland, certainly there was no formal uh, masking advice. It's not even mentioned that often in newspapers. It but wasn't like that. In different parts of the world. Oh yeah, okay. I was just gonna ask that. Uh, okay. Um, so, um, and you say um, eucalyptus was kind of an uh, the the way to to um, uh, way we use um, disinfectants today. Or was eucalyptus it? was used? With, people would douse it in their handkerchiefs, or they might spray ah, it in the air, okay. um, and then might then uh, they'd hold it up to their mouths and sniff it, or they might douse their scarves in it and wrap them around their their faces like that. Okay. There were lots of wonderful um, treatments at the time. Like one of the treatments I find most strange is um, uh, uh, gargle with creosote, which we think of as being, you know, very good at killing, um, uh, at preventing um, bacteria going on on, on fences. Um, not bacteria. Sorry, I'm trying to think of the word. I'm losing it now. Um, but. Um, to gargle with creosote seems very counterintuitive for us. And another regular treatment uh, was uh, an injection of strychnine, uh, which we wouldn't, we think, tend to think of as being a, a James Bond assassin's uh, poison of choice rather than uh, yeah. being a, a medical treatment. <laughs> um, the next question I have here is um, what other pandemics in history? Uh, would you say are most similar to COVID and the Spanish flu? Mm, hard question. Um, well, I suppose both of those are respiratory, basically respiratory infections. But I mean, obviously, the Black Death um, has to be, um, the plagues of Justinian have to be uh, close up there in terms of the impact that they made. And the Black Death, of course, was particularly uh, difficult economically was that one third of Europe's population affected by it and that uh, the European uh, economy basically shuts down for about 30 years after it, uh, mm -hmm. as my understanding of it, but I'm not a historian of that period. So I think, you know, that they, they would be the obvious ones to, to compare mm -hmm. in terms of long-term impact. And of course, then we also have what we have medical historians called the, the, the long pandemic or the long, you know, TB is rattling along there in the background, killing mm -hmm. more people in the longer yep. term than, than, than flu does. Yep. Mm, we are discussing a lot today about whether the state's measures against COVID might be a threat to democracy. Were there any of those, um, of, of those debates uh, around the end of um, the First World War II? I haven't seen that many of them, um, but then like my survey is mostly on, on, on Ireland and um, um, we were looking for democracy rather than, uh, you know, at the time um, and moving mm -hmm. towards it. Um, so um, we did see in the nationalist um, uh, papers there would be kind of an argument that oh we could manage our health affairs better ourselves and if only we were independent we'd be running this pandemic a lot better than, than, than what's happening mm. at the moment but I don't think that's true really because, because who could have managed it yeah I mean if you look at it now um, it doesn't matter as much as if you're, if you're democracy or not mm. but yeah exactly how you how you handle it if you compare New Zealand to the US um, it's, it's supposedly both a democracy, um, but the difference couldn't be any, any bigger. Mm. Um, sorry. No, it's okay. Go ahead. Um, can you talk, um, maybe last question now, um, since we are almost out of time, um, can you talk about the economic impact the Spanish flu had? Again, it's really hard to weave it, uh, to, to extract it from the war because inflation, it really in all of Europe is running massively high at the time. And while we talk about the inflation in Ireland, the, the inflation in countries um, uh, like Austria, Hungary was massive, huge, and the same in Russia uh, at the time. Um, so um, the two, it's, it's difficult to extract one from the other. Uh, and 
I suppose one of the temptations is always to look at something like the, the flu as a single incident, uh, mm. like our revolution or our re rebellion in 1916. You tend to look at it like that, but you can't. You have to look at it interwoven into everything else that was disturbing society at the time. But it definitely impacted on businesses. Some businesses closed and didn't reopen. Um, mm. You see you know, whole towns going quiet. You hear uh, talk in the newspapers of the stock market being disrupted, of um, diamond mining in the Transvaal going out, and, you know, all these things. Um, the, the, the economic impacts were there, but again, as I say, almost impossible to extract what was flu and what was caused by the war and what was caused by uh, domestic inflation all at the same time. Mm. It was a heck of a period. Yeah, can say that again. <laughs> did did anything good come out of the Spanish flu? Oh yeah, um, one of the stories um, I particularly like about the oral histories is that you see such good neighbourliness and such kindness, and mm -hmm. that's the thing that people talk about all the time. Like there isn't a question of people rushing away and refusing to go into a house because a uh, family is ill with the flu. Instead, they're there doing their best to help. Mm -hmm. And one story I particularly like was a neighbor of mine um, down in North Wexford told me um, that her mother and aunt uh, wanted, um, they actually lived in the house where I, I grew up as a child. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to go and help a family, that a farming family that were only a hundred meters away from them. Um, And the, word, the, 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 the mother, the father, and three of the children were all ill with the flu, but they were so afraid of it. They walked into Ferns, which was our nearest town, which is about five kilometers away, to ask the parish priest if God would protect them. And he said they would. So they went back that God would protect them. So they went back and they nursed them and, and the flu never came into their own families. But two of that family did die, but they saved the rest of them. But they took that risk. Mm -hmm. uh, for their families. And there were so many examples of, of that happening. And we see that now too. You know, people being so incredibly brave and so kind to neighbors and risking their own for it too. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that was one of the first things probably that, that happened um, when, when it started in, in March was that, that there were leaflets all over the city, well in Berlin at least, um, where people said, If you can't go outside because you're too old or you have health issues, call me. I'll do everything you want. I'll do groceries. I do your laundry, uh, things like that. And those those leaflets are still still out there uh, today. That's that's been amazing to watch. Yeah. It was absolutely fabulous. We had the same hair too, although I suppose oh. now at this stage there is a little bit of fatigue coming in, uh, and you hear people, you know, walking in public and saying, you know, keep back. And uh, other people are saying, well, no, that's all gone. It's past now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. It would be nice if they were right, but obviously we don't think they are. <laughs> um, so now really for, for the last question, um, do you think virologists and epidemiologists today should know more about the Spanish flu? Yes, I absolutely yeah. do. I, th I think um, that even though somebody like me, when I'm writing history, obviously I'm writing it through a historian's lens. I don't have the knowledge of a scientist looking at it. But I know um, that those friends of mine who are scientists, immunologists, virologists, who've read it, uh, have said that it is a help to understand what they're doing now and, mm -hmm. and the other work, of the work of other historians as well. Um, I think particularly uh, the work of Sven, Sven Eric Mameland has, has had enormous effect in uh, medicine tends to look at um, uh, the complications like diabetes and things like that, medical complications and how it will impact uh, people with those mm. comorbidities. Whereas what he's trying to point out is that things like literacy and size of housing and that all those things have to be taken into account too. And um, so studies, historical work uh, like his Uh, will help to inform uh, national pandemic preparedness plans of the future as well. So I think there are a lot of things that, 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 that um, they can look at. And indeed, Issa Jones is, is on the, um, as a historian, has been appointed uh, to the Canadian government's, um, I forget the name of the committee, but, but, but you know that, that it is about pandemic preparedness. Mm -hmm. um, so I, th I think um, 
every discipline is something to talk to um, yeah. about a situation like this. Yeah. Uh, but certainly historians do naturally, I think that. Right, yeah. It's basically the takeaway. Always, always ask historians. <laughs> Um, okay, so that's it. Uh, we, are, we are out of time, unfortunately. Thank you so much, Aida. It was great having you um, and listening to you tell us about the Spanish flu. I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone else uh, did too. Thank you Thanks so you much everyone. for having me. Be safe. You too. Thank you all for, for listening uh, and watching. We hope you had an excellent time and make sure to join us again next week when uh, Viv Newman will talk about COVID-19 and World War I nursing. So thank you again and have a nice evening, everyone.